Welcome everyone. Today we have a special guest, Dr. Christopher Patak. He's an expert on biodiversity. Welcome, Christopher. Could you please describe yourself? Yes, I'm, uh, I'm a botanist by training uh, from the University of New South Wales in uh, Australia. Um, I'd like to tell you my story. I was born in England. I grew up in, uh, in a place where I had access to uh, woods when I was young. So before I, t I was 10, before I moved uh, with my parents to Australia, I was able to uh, roam away from house uh, into the woods, play with the animals that, that I saw there and enjoy those woods. Uh, then we emigrated to Australia. I lived in an area which was semi-desert. And so in, in that place, uh, when it rained, we would dance in the street. We didn't have umbrellas. We would just be celebrating those five days a year when it rained. Then I became uh, a botanist when I went to the University of New South Wales. I went through university there and uh, trained uh, in science. When I was finishing my, uh, or at least working towards my doctorate, I got to travel to Hawaii. And so in Hawaii, I uh, got known uh, by um, the Bishop Museum in Hawaii. They invited me to take a job there uh, in uh, 1996, and I got there in 1998. I was there for 10 years. I met my wife there, who is, was also a scientist. Uh, she worked, uh, she was the, the state biologist in Hawaii. And so when uh, we, we got married, uh, we moved to Maryland. And so then in Maryland, uh, one of the things I did there was start working uh, with an organization that just was newly formed uh, with growing native plants. So we had the plant nursery of, uh, of Maryland and the Chesapeake Bay where we only produced native plants. So uh, running that uh, nonprofit, uh, I was able to have 15 years of, of work with, with them. We moved to Hawaii uh, uh, when my wife retired. And so now I'm back in Hawaii. Um, I was um, at that point the, um, the, the biologist or botanist for the Pacific. So I managed the, the collections for plants for the Pacific. Okay. Well, that's, that's my a, background. Yeah, that's a great story that from starting from your childhood, you're a nature lover and now you are working for the nature again. Yes. Yeah. So uh, the next question I think you asked me was, uh, uh, to do with where I am in uh, the world of, of uh, now with biodiversity. I work for, uh, as a volunteer for uh, Rotary International. And so essentially with biodiversity projects around the world, but anything to do with, with the environment. Um, we worked with the development of uh, the Rotary Action Group for environmental sustainability. And so through that, uh, we have been trying to get people to uh, change their behavior towards uh, the environment, looking after the environment through the projects that we do. So it seems that you're an active player in that field, in the sustainability. And I would like to ask you, how do you see this journey of sustainability, the transformation of the nature of the people? I, I see that the, the changes within uh, the uh, non-governmental organizations uh, working with the SDGs, uh, uh, Sustainable Development Goals, I see uh, those as being early adopters of uh, the SDGs. They try to get their businesses to be uh, much more in alignment uh, with the United Nations Development Goals. Uh, governments are obviously a little bit slower in being able to, to, to maneuver to that. But, but uh, so organizations like Rotary and other organizations uh, work with a mandate and a purpose for uh, developing uh, 
or maintaining their their products around uh, having looking at what the community needs, their business models, they're working towards those business models of serving the community that they're, they're working with. Yeah, in this system, it seems that everyone is interconnected with each of us, uh, with the uh, academy, with the universities, with the people. And how do you see that, how the NGOs and impact this journey? The NGOs because NGOs have a business model that uh, that wherever they are, they, they, an NGO has a passion for doing something that is going to benefit their, their organization. And so that passion may show itself in uh, a, a, a profit uh, model or it may, may be like the service organization like the Rotary that I work with and there's Lions and there's various other service organizations, they are really working with communities. They want to have a look at the community assessment to see where the communities want to develop, uh, see how they, they can improve those uh, communities in some way or another. And so from my point of view, we're working towards uh, looking after the environment and looking after humanity because humanity is going to always live in the environment. Even, even if it's a built environment, we have to look after what people are in in a built environment or a natural environment. Yeah, you are right. How about your reflections from COP29 in Baku in Azerbaijan? How do you experience this COP? Okay, so COP29 I think is uh, I've been mainly around the green zone and uh, what I've seen here, there are a few uh, government or, or country representatives. So, so there's Azerbaijan, uh, Turkey, uh, Brazil are here in, in this, this zone. Uh, I know in the blue zone, there's probably 150 different countries all doing their thing. Um, so the countries are really showing uh, where they are in that process of trying to um, show climate adaptation, mitigation, uh, as to where they are in, in that, uh, that whole process. Uh, personally, I always think that we should be looking at how to prevent the damage. We, we, we should be preempting uh, so I'd really love to see uh, countries doing more preemption rather than mitigation and adaptation. These are all, these are all to me. Uh, after you've been, you go to the, your health is 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 deteriorating. You now have to fix it. Yeah. And so this is what I see with the environment. You, we have we have created loss and damage to the environment. Now we have to try and repair that loss and damage. Yeah, actually, we should behave in a much more pro proactive way rather than the reactive, as you mentioned. Yeah, we are always having like mitigation plans, risk plans, risk management plans for the building this resilience. But I'm I'm totally agree with you. And how do you see the progress in the in the world? Uh, the progress in the world, uh, small steps. <laughs> Very small steps. One of the things I really liked, and uh, coming back to what I'm seeing at COP, you know, so there are several organizations that I see that are working really well. As, as a son is, is uh, working really well. Uh, there's um, Deloitte and um, McKinsey uh, producing ways of, of capturing data that's associated with with uh, whatever we're doing in the environment. I think that is critical, uh, that we actually understand wh um, what we do. If we don't educate ourselves on what we're doing now, we don't know how to create a better future for us. Yeah, uh, yeah. you are right. And I am also proud for my company, Azerson Holding, and also our agency, Media Balance, is hosting this platform to have uh, such, um, how can I say, expert guests like you that we can have and we can share more information about sustainability about the journey and we can 
act more. And I would like to ask you also about for this COP, the climate finance is one of the main uh, topics. But I see apart from the climate finance, I, I think for the, especially for non-developing countries, there's a, a gap in terms of the need and the progress. So how do you see that? How we can accelerate those gap, uh, for especially for non-developing countries? Okay, so that's a really good thing. Um, we in the in the developed countries have known what we've been doing wrong for 70 years or more, ever since Rachel Carson and Silent Spring. Um, we we have known that we know where we are falling short. I think one of the really uh, it's hard to say, but a beneficial thing from developing countries, we we can. Uh, uh, bypass a lot of the mistakes that we have made in the West, yeah, uh, right. in the developed countries. We can just go ahead and um, bring in uh, those things that are you know, offer them more to, than bring in. We don't want to be imperialists. We we have to say these are the things that we have learnt. Uh, now uh, you can accept them and see how we can move forward with that. I have a really great example when. Uh, we were just working down in Samoa with uh, um, King Charles, who was visiting there for the for Chogham, the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting, and there we were able to uh, work with uh, a small community for a mangrove restoration. By working with them, we were able to connect with uh, Starlink and um, and SpaceX. That community now has the best internet connection across the whole of Samoa. And just by the fact that we were able to skip uh, a whole lot of the, um, the problems that one may have had with connectivity. Mm -hmm. Also, I also actually uh, give importance to the daily uh, habits. So is there anything, any advice that you gave to the audience that how we can protect biodiversity at our homes, in our schools. So is there any like quick uh, ways? Oh, right. Yes. So I, I see uh, Dreamland over there. Um, I, what, I, what gives me, uh, we call it chicken skin in Hawaii, but goosebumps elsewhere in the world, is the fact that, that uh, we can um, put into those spaces, green spaces, that are, uh, we can restore some of what was there in the past, uh, or maybe maybe something that's not quite there. We can never re really restore something to what it was, but we can do something. Um, I've been involved with putting in uh, butterfly gardens across uh, Maryland uh, for 15 years, and uh, so by by introducing the plants that are associated with with uh, butterflies, you can bring those butterflies back. You can bring the birds back. You can bring the insects back. Uh, in uh, in the eastern United States, there's a fellow named Doug Tallamy who uh, has a series of books, and one of them is called Bringing Nature Home. Bringing Nature Home basically by if you um, bring back the plants that nature, uh, the, the, the insects and birds rely on, then you can then you can increase the, the biodiversity you have in your local space. And then that is a, a really a key thing for getting young people to really experience and feel nature close at hand. Just like when I was young, uh, uh, between when I was six and ten years old, I was able to play with nature and understand or feel it. Um, this is one of the things I really think that we need to, to have our young people do because when, when you're young, you can carry that uh, through for the rest of your life. You, the passion takes over about uh, how you feel about the environment. Yeah, I totally agree. I really like your advice that we can feel the soil, we can feel this, the biodiversity at home by experiencing with our kids. I really like that advice and I will use it definitely. And is there any message that you would like to give to our audience? Uh, yes, sure. Um, I'm an optimist and I believe that uh, we can, uh, if, if we're prepared to, to learn throughout our whole lives, not to just think that when we finish school, 
um, then we've stopped. We don't have to learn anymore. I think if you've got the passion for learning, then that is some, one thing that can keep you carrying on. Um, we, we need data uh, associated with, with uh, every place that we are. And so uh, I would really recommend that uh, if whatever we do, we, we can actually start recording that. And I mentioned Starlink before. Starlink is really interested in collecting data and, and getting it up available for people. And I know that uh, Echo Na is, is interested in, in capturing those sorts of data. It's, it's a really great program for analytics. And I can just see that, that every, every data point that we put into that system is going to create a new future for us. Uh, the other thing that uh, I would really encourage is, uh, as I mentioned before, I'd like to see more preemption. Uh, so getting rather than trying to repair damage, let's try and preserve, protect and uh, prevent damage. Uh, and then because restoring is always going to be catch up, we're going to have to try and, and, and spend a lot more money on trying to repair something, get it back to be healthy than we would have if we'd stopped uh, the damage in the first place. Thank you very much. We feel very happy to hear your thoughts as an expert and also as a sustainable to enthusiast, maybe I can call that like you, that so we can uh, share these good practices with everyone. So with togetherness, with partnerships, we can save the world. I'm an optimist as well uh, for this topic. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, to ac you accept our invite and we feel very happy to be with you today. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'd love everybody just to keep the passion of, of preserving planet Earth. Yeah, you're you. right. Thank you. Thank you.